member of the visible church by the waters of baptism. And before I call the parents as well as the office bearers, I thought it would be good for us to spend a few moments together considering from the scriptures why is it that we baptize the infants of believers. So first of all, what is baptism? Baptism is a sacrament, meaning it is a holy sign, a seal of the covenant of grace, wherein the washing with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost doth signify and seal our engrafting with Christ, our union with Christ. and partaking of the benefits of the covenant of grace and our engagement to be the Lord's. Now, why is it then that we baptize the infants of believers? Well, I want to give you, with God's help, five scriptural reasons, five biblical reasons why we baptize infant of believer, infants of believers. And then I would also like to share one clarification. So five reasons and one clarifications, just for one clarification, just for a few moments that we have. The first reason then why we baptize the infants of believers, the first reason, there is only one covenant of grace. Meaning, there's only one gospel, there's only one way of salvation. That's our first reason. So sinners in every age are saved the same way, by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. Ephesians 2 verses 8 and 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So Ephesians 2 is teaching us then that our salvation is not by our works, our salvation is not by our uh, our law keeping, but it is by the grace of God. And even our faith, whereby we're united to the Lord Jesus Christ forever, that faith is a gift of God. Saving faith is the gift of God. Galatians 2 verse 16 says, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. We believe in justification by faith alone. That is at the heart of the gospel. To deny justification by faith alone is to deny the gospel. And the only hope that we have as sinners, justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he forgives, he pardons all of our sins, and he accepts us as righteous in his sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. And so we are justified on the basis of the perfect obedience and law-keeping of Jesus Christ. And His righteousness, His full satisfaction in our place as our Redeemer is imputed to us, credited to us, and we receive it only one way, by faith alone. Faith is the alone instrument of justification. Now, all of that is not only true of New Testament believers, it's also true of the Old Testament believers. The Old Testament saints were saved the same way as we are saved. The salvation of Abraham and David and all of the Old Testament saints is the same as our salvation under the New Testament. So listen, for example, to Genesis 15 and verse 6. Genesis 15, verse 6. And he, that is Abraham, he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. Did you hear that? Abraham believed in the Lord. Abraham was justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Abraham looked forward to Christ. We look back at the Christ who has come. But our salvation is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 32, David speaks about the blessedness of those who are justified through faith alone by the imputation of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Listen, 
Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And so the Old and the New Testaments are not two covenants differing in substance but one and the same covenant of grace under various administrations, meaning that the Old Testament and the New Testament are two different administrations of the one covenant of grace, of the gospel. The covenant of grace is the same in essence in both the Old and the New Testaments. There's only one gospel. There's only one Savior. Sinners in every age are saved the same way. In Christ alone. Amen? So that's our first reason why we baptize uh, infants of believers. And this brings me to the second reason, second scriptural reason, having established that there's only one covenant of grace. Here's the second reason. Circumcision in the Old Testament was a sign and a seal of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Circumcision in the Old Testament was a sign, it pointed to, and it was a seal of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So listen to Romans 4, verse 11. Romans 4, verse 11. And he, that is Abraham, received, listen, the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness, of the faith, which he had, yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And so the Bible says in Romans 4.11 that Abraham received the sign of circumcision, which was a seal of the righteousness that, righteousness that he received by faith. You see that? Now here's my question to you. Whose righteousness did Abraham receive? Whose righteousness was imputed to Abraham? Was it his own righteousness? His own law keeping? Was that the basis of Abraham's salvation? Of course not. It was the righteousness of Jesus Christ that was imputed to Abraham. And he received it by faith alone. And he was justified before God. He was accepted as, as righteous before God on the basis of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And Romans 4.11 is saying that circumcision pointed to that. Circumcision was a sign and a seal of justification by faith alone. Justification by faith alone. Circumcision pointed to the necessity of faith in Christ in order to be saved. Amen? So that the message of the Old Testament is not, try to keep the Ten Commandments as best as you can. And then the Lord will decide whether you have done the best you can and on the basis of your marriage, whether he would accept you or not. That's not the message of the Old Testament. The message of the Old Testament is circumcise your hearts. You need a heart transformation. Believe in the Lord. Believe in his mercy. The Lord is merciful. The L salvation belongs to the Lord. That's the message of the Old Testament, right? That's what the book of Psalms says. But remember Jonah, when he was in the belly of the fish, what did he say? He said, salvation belongs to the Lord. This is the message of the entire Old Testament. Salvation belongs to the Lord and he saves sinners, not by our works, but through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to put our faith in him. If we don't believe in the Messiah, we will perish. Think of Psalm 2. Kiss the son lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. For his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their faith, their trust in him. So we must believe upon the Lord Jesus, not just in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. But watch this. So circumcision pointed to the necessity of faith, and yet... God commanded Abraham to administer the gospel sacrament of circumcision to his infant child, Isaac, who was not able to make a profession of faith when he was an infant. And yet God said, circumcise Isaac. 
So God made the promise of the covenant, listen, to believers and to their children. Listen to Genesis 17, verse 7. And this is a key text, Genesis 17, verse 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, Abraham, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. This is God's promise to Abraham. I will be a God to thee and to thy seed. Third reason, third biblical reason why we baptize infants of believers. In the New Testament, baptism has replaced circumcision as the covenant sign. The covenant sign of the old covenant was circumcision, which is now replaced by baptism. So listen to Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the the dead. Do you hear the language of continuity and the connection between circumcision and baptism in Colossians chapter 2? Both baptism and circumcision point to the gospel of Jesus Christ and to our union with him. In fact, Paul calls baptism, quote, the circumcision of Christ. The circumcision of Christ. Therefore, the children of believers are to be baptized and included in the visible church according to God's command in Genesis 17, verse 7. I will be a God to thee and to thy seed. Fourth reason, just two more. Fourth reason, rather than rescinding or canceling or abrogating the promise, the covenant promise to believers and to their children in the New Testament, God reaffirms it. Instead of canceling the covenant promise of Genesis 17, verse 7, God reaffirms it in the New Testament. So listen to Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent! And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Again, do you hear the language of the Abrahamic covenant? Who were, who were the people who heard the message on the day of Pentecost? These were the Jews who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul, Peter tells them, the promise is to you and to your children. God says in Genesis 17, verse 7, I will be a God to thee and to thy seed. Peter God, through the mouth of Peter, reaffirms the promise to believers and to their children. And then there are many other places in the New Testament where we can turn to. For the sake of time, we will not. But for example, the household baptisms in the book of Acts. Here's my question. Why was there a need to mention that the entire households were baptized if God had canceled in the New Testament the principle of familial solidarity of the Old Testament. No, God affirms it in the New Testament, and he continues to be a God to us and to our children. Listen to Acts 16, verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, comma, and thy house. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And then 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14 says that the children of even one parent who is a believer are holy. The children of even one believing parent are holy. What does that mean? 
It doesn't mean that our children are sinless. It doesn't mean that our children are automatically saved. The word holy means set apart, separated unto the Lord. Our children belong to the Lord and to the visible church. And then finally, the fifth reason. The fifth reason why we baptize infants of believers. The visible church consists of believers and of their children. The visible church consists of believers and of their children. So here's my question for us. How does God view the children of believers? Does God regard the children of believers as outsiders or as members of the visible church? How should we treat our children? Should we treat our children as pagans or should we treat them as covenant children that are to be raised in Christian homes and brought to the Christian church? In Mark 10, verse 14, the Lord Jesus says about the children of believers, listen, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. And so Jesus, our Savior, admitted covenant children into his presence and blessed them. In Ephesians 6, verse 1, the Apostle Paul addresses the children of believers. Did you know that? Ephesians 6, verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6, verse 1. Who did the Apostle Paul write the letter to the Ephesians to? Who did he write the letter to? He wrote the book of Ephesians to the saints which are in Ephesus. Ephesians 1 verse 1. But in that audience, who is including? Children. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. And so the apostle Paul considered the children of believers as members of the visible church. Therefore, the infants of believers must be welcomed into the covenant community And by the covenant sign of baptism, the children of believers are to be distinguished from the world and solemnly admitted into the visible church. Those are the five biblical reasons why we baptize covenant children. Now, one clarification, one clarification. We do not believe that our children are saved or regenerated by the mere waters of baptism. As Reformed Christians, as Presbyterians, as, uh, uh, as those who subscribe to the Westminster standards, but, but most importantly, who uphold the word of God, we reject the doctrine of baptismal regeneration. That is unbiblical. In other words, we don't believe that just because our children are baptized, they're automatically saved, they are believers Uh, regenerated. No, baptism is a sign of regeneration and our union with Christ, but baptism itself is not regeneration. It is a sign and a seal of the gospel. And so the Heidelberg Catechism asks in question 72, is then the external baptism with water the washing away of sin itself? Answer, not at all. For the blood of Jesus Christ only and the Holy Ghost cleanse us from all sin. 1 John 1 verse 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So no one is saved by mere waters of baptism any more than believers were saved by circumcision in the Old Testament. Our children must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Little Eli and all of our covenant children must believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And this is why parents are encouraged to raise uh, their children in the Christian faith, teach them the gospel every day in family worship, and bring them to church to sit under the ministry of the Word of God. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians 6. This is why we don't do children's church. We don't do kids' church. We don't send our children elsewhere when the word is read and the, when, when the word is preached. No, we want to keep our children with us because they're members of the visible church. And we want them to hear the preaching of the gospel just like we want adults to hear the preaching of the gospel. 
We want our children to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why we keep